Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, scientists, educators, social scientists, and government leaders. We meet each one to one. Defending convicted criminals while being mommy to three young girls is a delicate balancing act, but Claudia Troop not only manages it, but learns and applies the lessons she learns from each part of her life. It's the subject of her book, Hard Time and Nursery Rhymes, A Mother's Tales of Law and Disorder. It's just been published by Rodell Books. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Tell me about the your career trajectory from law school and how you got into the, the, line, the line of work you're in. Okay. Right out of law school, um, well, actually, even before I went to law school, I had been interested in criminal law just because criminal law, for me, always felt like the area of law that had the most interesting storylines. Um, so I worked I always felt like the area of law that had the most interesting storylines. Um, so I worked at the district attorney's office during college, and I was actually in a narcotic, narcotics part um, in helping people to investigate uh, people who were selling both small and large quantities of drugs, and I would sit through the trials and look. And I felt doing that work that I always had sympathy for the person sitting at the defense table, which was a revelation to me because I had always thought, well, maybe I'll become a prosecutor. When, this was when I was very young. Um, so when I went to law school, I had wanted to be a criminal defense attorney, but one thing led to another, and I ended up do, going to a large corporate law firm in New Jersey. And I was there for a year uh, trying to pay off my law school loans that my husband and I had accumulated. And while I was there, I just realized that I was so unhappy doing corporate work. Um, I just didn't feel that. I knew that it mattered to the clients and that it mattered you know, to whoever was involved in the case, but it just didn't feel like it mattered to me. And so I wanted to do work where I would have more of a feeling of connection to my client, personal connection. And so I applied to the Legal Aid Society, and um, I went to the Appeals Bureau and started doing appellate work. And eventually, I came to my current office, which is um, also does appellate work for indigent defendants. Now, what's the difference between the Legal Aid Society and the office that you work for? Um, well, the Legal Aid Society, uh, I don't know if you followed this, but in the um, 1990s, early 1990s, there was a strike, and the Giuliani administration uh, basically following the strike created alternative legal providers and so um, my office it was one of those alternative legal providers that was created as a result in the wake of the legal aid strike in the 1990s. But legal aid, the Legal Aid Society still exists? Yes it does and the Appeals Bureau of the Legal Aid Society still exists. They do similar type work it's just it's divided up now among various providers. Are criminal defense attorneys a special breed Absolutely. of lawyer? Absolutely. Um, I think there's I always say when I interview people who come to want to work in my office that you're sort of born a criminal defense attorney or not. Um, I saw this recently. I went to speak to my daughter's class in school and I was they were having a criminal justice unit and you could just tell where people's sympathies lied you know lay it was I was talking about some of my cases and I was talking about a client who'd had a gun. Um, found on him and one of the little boys stood up and said, well, just because the gun was on him didn't mean that the police didn't plant it there. Wow. <laughs> How old was he? He was in fifth grade. Okay. And I said, there you go. There's a criminal defense attorney. Wow. You know. And my daughter, on the other hand, got out of there and said, I don't know how you can defend these people, Mom. I mean, they're so obviously guilty. You know. Mm -hmm. So people, I think, are born with certain proclivities. I think a criminal defense attorney generally sympathizes with the underdog, mm -hmm. is, is suspicious of power and authority and is always looking for the gray. I right. think that um, when I see a case, it's very, I can always find the sympathetic factors relating to my client in that case, whether it's that he's been convicted of something more severe than really I think the facts call for, or his background, or you know, there's just factors in the case that really make me feel sympathy toward yeah. that client. Not yeah. every client right. is sympathetic right away, but I'd say in around 99.9% .9 of my cases, I can find something that I feel um, sympathy toward my client. It was interesting to read that when you are an, a, a criminal appeals attorney, it's not always necessary to meet your client. Um, that's true. That's um, and in some cases, is it better not to meet your client? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I really enjoy meeting my clients. For me, and I talk about this in the book. It's when I meet a client, the struggle takes on a new dimension because the person becomes much more real to me in a way. And I think it's just good to meet the person and for the client to meet you. 
um, and to see, to be able, there's something about a face-to-face -face meeting that I think provides a depth through a relationship that can't be accomplished any other way. That said, it is impossible given the nature of the um, criminal, the prison system in New York State, how it's spread all over. A lot of my clients are housed up near the Canadian border. And it's difficult, very difficult. Hard to, to get to. It's <laughs> very hard to get to. And so while I do meet, I would say the majority of my clients, I really do, because either I make those trips or they come down for further court proceedings. So I do end up meeting them. Um, there are clients who I have never met. But you decide whether or not it's a case worth pursuing by reading the record, right? Well, I mean, every case needs to be pursued in New York State and most of every other jurisdiction. Everybody has the right to appeal one time as of right to an intermediate appellate court in New York State, so cases in Supreme Court go to the appellate division. So we are uh, public defenders, and we don't get to pick and choose which cases we take. So if we're assigned a case, we pursue it and file and perfect the appeal. And then you have to decide whether you want to go for a second appeal, which is not as of right or what? Um, right. Well, the appeal to the Court of Appeals is by petition, so you okay. have to request permission. And okay. the Court of Appeals takes cases that are of statewide importance, so they're not looking to just correct an error that happened in a particular case. They look for cases that are going to impact the state of the law in right. New York State. You talk about having a sixth sense. <laughs> um, does it tell you whether a client is innocent or guilty or whether there's been something amiss in the at trial? Yes, I think more it tells me whether something was amiss at trial rather than if a client is innocent or guilty. Um, having done this work, I've been doing this work now for 15 years, I have a real sense of whether, how a case is ordinarily tried. So if I have a robbery case, it's not the first robbery case I've done, it might be the 150th robbery right. case I've done. And so I know what a robbery prosecution should look like, or usually looks like. And so if I see a case where the victim isn't coming in, or I see a case where something is really out of whack, and sometimes it's as simple as the complainant's testimony just doesn't make sense to me. You know, we had a case recently where the complainant testified that he had been at an all-night children's birthday party, and then he had left the birthday party and nobody could give him a ride home, so he called the garage where he worked and nobody could send a cab to him, so he was out on the street, and then he was, and the story just didn't seem to hold together to me. It just first didn't of all, make, who has an all-night children's <laughs> birthday party? That was my first point, you know, where, <laughs> where nothing is being, nobody's drinking anything other than juice, right. you know, so it just didn't really, it didn't really hang together just for me. Just juice and cupcakes. Like, juice and cupcakes for this four-year-old, you know. Know, and that's again where you know being a parent sort of kicks in right, because you know right. you're not having those all-night right. children's birthday parties. And so we opened that case up to reinvestigation. We found out a lot of things that didn't make sense in that particular mm -hmm. case. You know, a lot of books of your type are about the conflict between work and mothering, uh, but your book takes the the tack that. Both of those areas seem to feed and reinforce each other in, in some respects. That, I think that is the main message of my book, because so much has been written about mothers who feel torn and guilt-ridden. And of course, there is that in my book. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say I never feel guilty about missing certain things or that I can't be there You know, when my kids get home every day. There are moments of guilt. But my primary message and my primary experience is that I'm a better mother because I have another outlet for my energies and um, other experiences that I find challenging in my own professional identity. I feel like it's important that my girls see me as a person in the world who's doing her own thing and who has experiences and um, expertise in, right. in things that are outside of the home. And I feel like I'm a better lawyer because I have an understanding of people that comes from being in the family realm and dealing with children and seeing. I, I remember you, you talked about um, having to talk to one of your clients. You're meeting the client, and you said, having had experience talking to a two year old right. really helped you with that. Right. Well, there's a lot of times where that comes into play. Sometimes people become very upset. I mean, I work in a system that can be very frustrating, very upsetting. Emo the stakes are very high, emotions are very high. And having had the experience of dealing with children and having to take a step back, I mean, you know, anybody who can talk a child through a tantrum or get convince a child to go to bed on time, those are all experiences that really test your patience, mm -hmm. your ability to reason, your ability to persuade. And those kind of things help me when I'm dealing with clients. Not that I treat my clients as children, I don't. They're adults and they need to be. 
but there is there are certain basic human skills that come right. into parenting that I find very useful in terms of dealing with my clients. A large part of your job is reading case files, which can run in the thousands of pages. Mm -hmm. Tell me what that is like. I actually really like it, and I was speaking to a trial defense attorney the other day, and she said, I don't know how you stand it. I would just fall asleep um, sitting at my desk going through thousands of pages. What I like about it is I've always liked to read. I, I, you know, That's one thing that I actually miss is mm -hmm. the chance to read for pleasure. But um, I like getting into a case and diving into a case, and a case is a story, and it's interesting to see the different characters, both in terms of the, cr you know, the criminal aspect of it, the players in the crime, and also the judges, the attorneys, there's so many different personalities that are in a case. Right. And it's always fascinating, and I enjoy that, and also just having the time to think, mm -hmm. which is such a luxury, and especially as a mother, so many times when I'm at home, there's 30 different people asking me, you know, the school's calling for this, and my little one needs me to help her pick out an outfit. Right. So there's just so much chaos. and. Being at work and having a large file and having the opportunity to think is such a luxury. Mm -hmm. And it's so, in a way, relaxing. Some people are going to say you're a very sick person. I know. Well, yeah, <laughs> and I would cop to that. You know, when I interview people, I'm like, you have to be very strange to love this job. I'm, but and I, I know you've said that some of the best stuff, some of the best material, is, is often in the prosecutor's footnotes. Yes, yes, definitely. I like to read um, what the process, whenever the prosecutors are trying to hide a sticky fact or something that they want to de-emphasize, they always put it in the footnotes. Mm -hmm. And so I love reading. Sometimes I'll just go through and just read the footnotes <laughs> just to see what mm -hmm. I really have to be keyed into right. in terms of the prosecutor's side of the story. Yeah. And so I think now they're starting to realize that it's not such a great way of doing it because it does highlight it. But, um, and I never footnote bad facts. I okay. always try to work them in and deal with them. I think as a defense attorney, one thing you learn early um, and often is that there's no hiding your facts. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to. An appellate judge once told me, if I don't want to rule for you by the time I'm done reading your statement of facts, you've lost your case. Mm -hmm. So in other words, they know what the law is. Right. They know, they have a sense of where the law is going. All you have is your facts right. and why what happened here is... Um, unjust or unfair and needs some relief. Mm -hmm. So We're going to take a short break, then I'll be back with more with Claudia Troop, author of Hard Time and Nursery Rhymes, A Mother's Tales of Law and Disorder. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. I'm talking with criminal defense attorney, wife, and mom, Claudia Troop. She's the author of Hard Time and Nursery Rhymes, A Mother's Tales of Law and Disorder. Each of your cases, and these are appeals cases, uh, takes months, if not years, of digging and waiting. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that could be very frustrating. It can be frustrating, um, but the reality is is that each case might take years or months, but you always have a number of cases on which you're working. And so it's sort of like being a waitress. You know, somebody might be on appetizers, mm -hmm. somebody might be on dessert, somebody might be on drink. You have to you have to spread yourself out and figure out what needs to be done that day. So whereas the years go slowly, you're always busy. So right. in that way, they go. the cases go right. quickly. Right. And it is frustrating, though. Sometimes the process can be excruciatingly slow. For mm -hmm. example, when you file a habeas in federal court, that can take years. You can file a brief and wait four years for right. a decision. Right. And that's frustrating because you forget the core of what your arguments are over the course right. of waiting that long. Right. And it's going slowly for, you, for your client. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. I don't mean to diminish what my clients are going through in terms of how uh, long it takes and the inefficiency there. You had one case where you felt reluctant to sort of out the um, incompetency of the defense attorney, a guy named Daniel Gordon. Um, but I think you, you did, and finally that was the theory of the case, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. The last case in the book. Yeah. The last case. Um, do you feel conflicted about that? I about going after 
other attorney's competence? Well, I mean, the attorneys I go after would say I feel no conflict <laughs> because I, they would say I'm very relentless and unfair. But I do feel, um, having tried cases, a, a small number, having been on the other side, I know how hard it is to um, cover everything, to not miss everything. And so I tend to want to give trial defense attorneys the benefit of the doubt and to not in a knee-jerk fashion say because the, my client was convicted this defense attorney must have been incompetent. That said, um, I also feel frustrated by the level of representation that my clients receive even that's not classically ineffective assistance of counsel, no appellate court would say, but just sort of um, run-of-the-mill misses, right. you know, that not challenging a status of a predicate felony. In other words, when you've been convicted of a felony previously, you get a higher sentence, and sometimes there are valid challenges to be made to that status, and they're not made. So there's routine sort of oversights due to the volume of cases that mm -hmm. um, particularly indigent defenders um, take on that is frustrating as an appeals attorney. And also, we always are complaining that they don't preserve issues, meaning they don't object in specific terms to right. errors that are going on in the trial courts. So, You have clients, some of whom have been convicted of pretty disgusting crimes. Do you have to believe in your client's innocence in order to pursue the appeal aggressively? Absolutely not. Um, if that were the case, then I couldn't pursue many of my cases aggressively. Sometimes um, the evidence of a client's guilt is persuasive or it's, um, you know, it can be strong. But there's often, I never or very, very rarely find a case where I don't feel there's something that went wrong. And my job is not to consider whether my client is innocent or guilty. That was the jury's job. My job is to see whether anything happened during the trial that impacted that jury determination. Right. And so it's really not my job. It's not the appellate court's job to decide whether my client is innocent or guilty. That's for the jury or whoever is finding the facts. And the question for us on appeal is what happened here that might have impacted the fairness of those proceedings. Do you get the sense that there are a lot of innocent people in prison? I feel that there definitely are innocent people in prison. Um, a lot, I, the amount of people or the percentage of people wrongfully convicted of crimes they haven't committed is subject to debate among academics and has never really been nailed down. But I definitely see cases in which my client is not guilty of the crime of which he is convicted. In other words, he might have done something, something happened, something mm -hmm. happened during the incident, but it wasn't a first degree robbery right. or it wasn't, um, you know, it just wasn't what he's And I think a lot of people miss, I mean, civilians miss the fact that it really matters. Oh. They, I mean, a lot of them says, well, you know, maybe he didn't commit that crime, he probably did something else, and but it really matters. Well, it certainly matters in terms of the amount of prison time yeah. that's imposed. Yeah. And in the criminal justice system, there can be, tr especially in the cases that I handle, I deal with serious felonies, the prison sentences are incredibly long. And so for somebody to be convicted of a top grade offense when really he might have been guilty of only an, a, a grade one or two steps beneath, right. that's a serious uh, injustice. I think about the case of uh, your client, Ramon Jimenez, uh, a Boston U college student who, while he was at home on vacation, went over to look at a fight that was, observe a fight that was going on right. and wound up getting blood on him and wound up being charged with attempted murder. Attempted murder. And right. is, in, is he still in, is he still in, prison? in prison? Yes, as a matter of fact, I just had an uh, interview on Monday about that. Right. Yeah, he's still in prison. And the fact is, is that once you have been convicted of a crime, it is very difficult. I mean, the question I have to answer all the time that clients want to know is, what are my chances right. of uh, getting some relief? And my answer is always the same. It is very difficult once that jury verdict comes down, especially in the context right. of a violent crime. It's very difficult to get relief because the system loves finality. It loves to put cases to rest. Right. Um, crime is not something in which we're in short supply of, and so there's always new cases coming through the system which need to be dealt with, and so bringing back old cases is nothing that the system is anxious right. to do. My observation as a journalist is that um, the system is often very cavalier about how it treats uh, particularly people of color you know, uh, cavalier about sort of thro throwing away, throwing away the lives of these people with long sentences or, well, he may not have done that, but he probably did something. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you find that uh, 
racial discrimination in the way clients are treated, or maybe most of your clients are well, the vast majority of people my of clients color. are people of color, and so do I see, um, is, that a, is that a coincidence? No, I don't believe it is, particularly in the context of drug prosecutions. You know, there has been a history of prosecuting low-level drug crimes in a very serious manner and taking people who have been convicted, you know, let's say twice of a street-level sale and putting them in prison for four and a half to nine years for a small sale. That has tremendous impact on people of color. Those, those policies have tremendous impact because the vast majority of people who I've represented on drug cases are people of color. Yeah. And so I think that, and that's something that we, as, defen as the defense bar, have been working to change and bring drug reform to New York State and have been successful lately in terms of trying to lessen the sentences right. and to try to get more treatment for people because not only is that more just, it's more effective in the long run. If you can treat people's addiction, if you can get people into programs, it costs less money and it's really better for everyone. It's better for the communities, it's better for the safety of, of the streets, it's better for everything. If you take somebody out of their community for four and a half to nine years, eventually they're coming back and they're coming back worse off than they went in, generally speaking. So, yes, I do feel that there has been um, a cavalierness about in that context, particularly. Which case, which of your cases haunts you the most? Oh, I think probably the one that you've mentioned with my client who was sort of swept up in that gang assault um, and remains in prison. That one haunts me the most. Because and he's been in prison how long? He's been in prison since May of 1999. So it's going wow. on. It's been 10 years. Yeah, and wow. I've been involved in that case for wow. uh, since May of 2002. Which case brought you the most pleasure in terms of its resolution? Um, the case that brought me the most pleasure is the second one in the book, which was a woman who was convicted of felony murder um, because she had been involved in a, a heist of the... She was a money counter in a money counting house for a drug organization and she had been involved in a heist and the um, manager of that house had been killed and she was convicted of felony murder at a very young age. And I was able to get that conviction reversed and I just spoke to her the other day and she's out. She's doing great. She has a full-time job. She got married. She's ha having a baby in August. She's living the life that she wants and that nothing makes me feel better to mm -hmm. know that because she had a life sentence. Nothing makes you feel better as a criminal right. defense attorney to feel that you gave somebody back her life. Who are the good guys and who are the bad guys in the criminal justice system? I'm not talking about the defendants. I'm talking about the there, other people. There are the good guys are the people who care and work hard on all sides of the aisle and on the bench to make sure that justice is done. Those are the good guys, the people who think about cases, the judges who are there until 8 o'clock at night working on a jury charge to make sure it effectively um, explains the concepts to the jurors, the, the prosecutors who are able to see a case for what it's worth and to cut somebody a break when they deserve it, uh, the criminal defense attorneys who work hard and long hours with little pay to make sure that their clients receive excellent representation, those are the good guys. The bad guys are the people who don't honor their obligations and who... And they can be anywhere. They can be anywhere. And, you know, it's easy in the system to get ground down. It's easy to... It's easier to stop caring at some point. And um, the good guys are the ones who never stop caring. Do you keep in touch with your former clients? I do. I do keep in touch with my former clients and their families. And, um, you know, I, I, I really, some people, it was once said that, the, you know, law would be perfect without the clients, <laughs> the practice of law, but I don't feel that way. I feel like the clients are what make the practice of law fun and real and human and interesting. What do your children think of your work? Um, they have differing understandings of my work. I think mostly they're proud of the fact that I help people. I think it's easier for them to understand what I do versus some of my friends who might work in a corporate setting. Um, so they're proud that mommy goes off and helps people and, you know, people who are in jail. My little one said to me the other day, so you go to the judge and you s tell him to let your client go. And I said, yeah. And she said, so you're like Moses, only a girl. <laughs> <laughs> So, do, you, do you think you have a defense lawyer in the family, or do you have a prosecutor, or do you have I both? I think my oldest one is definitely more a prosecutor, but I don't think she'll become a lawyer, um, and I think my middle one is more of a defense attorney. Sometimes okay. she can draw those lines that really need to be drawn. There you go. There you go. We're out of time, okay. but I want to thank Claudia Troop for joining me. Hard Time and Nursery Rhymes, A Mother's Tales of Law and Disorder, has just been published by Rodale Books. For the City University of New York, 
and one-to-one, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.